Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Greenspan. I'm professor and chairman of pediatrics at Thomas Jefferson University and Nemours Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children. I'm going to do a little case study for you uh, on thermoregulation. Uh, welcome to the Nick University uh, viewers. Uh, baby girl L is our, our case. Uh, she was the 26-week uh, preterm infant delivered uh, to a mother uh, uh, with good prenatal care. Her problems uh, were, the reason for her delivery was related to maternal issues, and so the baby really had very low uh, incidence of um, uh, chance of sepsis or other problems. She was really delivered at, in a relatively healthy state uh, with good APGARs. We're now looking at her at day of life two. Uh, she does have moderate respiratory distress syndrome despite receiving two doses of surfactant therapy. As you can see, she's on a ventilator, uh, but has, is on relatively low ventilator support. She does have transparent skin, and what we're going to be talking today about, what are her risks uh, in terms of her thermoregulation, how to manage her uh, in, in terms of um, keeping her warm and uh, safe, and um, what do we know about uh, thermoregulation today. Um, the uh, first thing I want to talk about is thermal environments. Uh, but I will um, preface this by saying that I think uh, in, ne in the neonatal intensive care unit, we think we really have this down. Uh, this is a problem that um, uh, occurs to almost every baby, and it's really been relegated to uh, protocols or um, uh, word of mouth or just uh, matter of style, and so we're going to try to hone in on some of the issues that go on with these babies. Clearly, there's a couple of environments that we want to talk about, the intrauterine thermal environment, the extrauterine, or once they're in our hands, thermal environment, and what is the neutral thermal environment. Um, so, uh, importantly, uh, changes at birth occur dramatically in terms of the thermal regulation of the baby, and in fact, uh, it is important that you recognize at birth that a thermoregulation is something we have to pay a great deal of atten attention to. The core temperature of the baby at birth is uh, in utero is a little bit higher than the mom, and it soon drops, and it can drop rapidly, especially in the preterm baby, uh, soon thereafter. And so our job is to try to keep that body temperature up to some degree, uh, and that's the drying and warming that occurs in the delivery room, and that has to continue uh, throughout the process uh, of uh, the delivery room uh, activities uh, through transfer to intensive care. Um, many different uh, features of the extra uterine thermal environment that we now find ourselves in with this preterm baby uh, are important. The, clearly, the ambient air temperature is going to be important. The humidity, any air blowing over the baby is going to be important, as well as any of the objects that are in direct content contact with the baby, as well as objects not in direct content, contact can affect the, uh, the temperature stability of the baby. Uh, what is the neutral thermal environment? This is what our goal is. is it, it's a relatively narrow range of environmental temperature in which the infant can be maintained in a normal body temperature with the least amount of energy going on to maintain it. So you want to really take temperature out of the equation for the baby. They have enough else going on. You want them to be in the perfect state so they don't have to expend any energy or any concern uh, to maintaining a normal body temperature. We know that the single most important thing we did uh, historically to save babies' lives is to warm them. Uh, preterm babies needed that uh, in particular, and that saved more lives historically over time than any other therapy we have given. And now, in the intensive care nursery, we sort of assume this is going on, uh, but it's important that we maintain these babies and understand fully what the neutral thermal environment really is. And that is depicted in this slide. So as the environmental t uh, temperature increases on the, uh, the x-axis, you'll see metabolic rate really vary quite significantly. So as the baby gets colder in the blue range, you'll have inevitable body cooling. There's nothing the baby can do to maintain their temperature. And if you get the temperature too hot, you have inevitable body heating, and the baby will suffer from uh, too much heat. Either process can lead to death. 
And even within the thermoneutral range, regulatory range, so the baby may have a no relatively normal temperature, uh, there is still just a small gray box which represents an area of uh, thermal neutrality where the baby is really optimized in terms of the energies needed to keep that temperature stable. So uh, if you're looking at core temperature, it may take a great deal of uh, wasted energy and time before you get to either the blue or red areas. The baby is finding ways, and adults for that matter, are finding ways to maintain a relatively normal uh, core temperature but there's, there's other regulatory mechanisms that are kicking in before you get to uh, cooling or heating. It also matters what the body's, baby's weight is as well as their age and days. And so uh, normal values for neutral thermal zones vary with weight and age as depicted in this slide. Um, and a baby that is, up, that, is, that is both younger and smaller will need higher temperatures to maintain, to maintain the neutral thermal zone than babies that are larger or older. Uh, what are some of the factors that determine the rate of heat production? Well, babies do differ, differ as we do. So babies have different metabolic rates. Uh, they have different amounts of muscle activities. This can change both from baby to baby as well as time of day. Uh, there, there's uh, effects of, of uh, hormones such as thyroxin, the effect of the symp sympathetic nervous system. So babies are very different and this can kick them in and out of that uh, neutral thermal zone uh, very rapidly and, and has to be uh, uh, accounted for. Um, so there's really no one fine set point that you can use for each baby. Each baby differs. And when they get out of balance, what can a baby do? Well, adults actually have quite a few options to try to stay warm if they're cold or, or, or get cooler if they're hot. So they can change their movement and activity. You know, you can start jumping up and down if you're cold, for instance. Um, both babies and infants, uh, infants and adults can change their posture. You'll see certainly, you know, adults will curl up if they're cold. Uh, they can become agitated or, or, or restless. Uh, both adults and children can do that. Infants can do that as well. Um, they both, both infants and adults, will uh, change the vasoconstriction. So uh, a baby will uh, vasoconstrict, as you can see, on their skin becoming pale when they get cold, uh, as would an adult. But an adult can shiver and produce goosebumps. Uh, that, that will uh, allow for increased heat. Babies, infants are not capable of shivering or producing goosebumps. But babies do have brown fat, more brown fat metabolism than adults, and these are ways of producing heat, uh, we call non-shivering thermogenesis. So babies do have this mechanism. And um, non-shivering thermogenesis does produce heat, particularly in brown fat, uh, which allows um, the blood that passes through it as it's being metabolized to heat up. And this is particularly true in term babies who have a brown fat distribution is depicted in this slide. Preterm babies will obviously have less of this. And this is something that um, uh, will help the, the term baby uh, um, adapt to um, thermo uh, uh, irregularities um, when they can't do things like shiver or produce goosebumps. Now, you have no lecture of thermoregulation or t discussion about this baby can, can occur without the typical four mechanisms discussed, evaporation, conduction, convection, and radiation. This is uh, dr drummed into us through all of our education. And it's important to recognize uh, that these, all four of these interplay uh, really on a continuous basis in the nursery. So evaporation, clearly important, conduction, uh, which is just what you're in contact with, convection, which is the uh, effect of air movement over the baby, and sort of the mad, more magical uh, heat transfer mechanism, radiation, which is not the direct content, but contact, but similar to what the sunlight or fires do, uh, passing through uh, to you and impacting on you. And so radiation is the is the impact of, say, a, a lighted window or that's moving from light to dark, and you'll see the needs change as the baby uh, reacts to that. Um, there are particular thermal challenges to a small baby, and that's something we have to re recognize and deal with. They clearly have a much different surface area uh, uh, than an adult, and actually a preterm baby has a much different surface area uh, content than a term baby. 
Uh, this is particularly true in a very low birth weight infant. And obviously, as is true in the baby we're discussing, uh, trans-epidermal th water loss is a big issue. So the more transparent the skin, the more likely it is that, that, that uh, both heat and moisture will escape through the skin. And that's something we have to compensate for. Uh, this is a depiction of the surface area of the term neonate versus the adult. And you can look at the, just looking at the head size, the, the baby is 21% head size and the adult is only 7% head size. And so uh, that's why the proportions are, are so different and, and it's so, so much more challenging to manage the thermoregulation of a, of, a, of a baby than an adult. One of the reasons we put a cap on the head is because it's really all, almost a quarter of the baby's size is, is stuck in the head and that's, that should be dried and, and, and warmed uh, soon after birth. In the very low birth weight infant, we're dealing with um, a very large skin area in relation to the body mass, particularly uh, related to adults, but also in, term, in terms of term, relationship to term babies. And so if you have a transparent skin, uh, and you have this large surface area, uh, all habit can, uh, can, can play out in terms of thermoregulation. Uh, there is a much thinner insulating layer of fat than a, than a term infant. Uh, there's also a minimal distance from the core to the surface. Uh, uh, this goes without saying, but the distance uh, from the skin to the core temperature uh, um, parts of the body are, is very small and there's not a lot of time, there may not be a lot of time uh, from uh, cooling the surface to cooling the core. And uh, other, other things, many other things are different, including low glycogen storage, so the baby has some energy challenges uh, that occur if they're low, very low birth weight. Um, in addition to uh, the trans-epidermal water loss, we talked about uh, preterm babies, particularly ones uh, with respiratory distress, will have increased respiratory water loss. That's taken care of somewhat by humidified gases in ventilators, but it should be a consideration. Uh, uh, so if a baby's breathing uh, room air that's not humidified, there's going to be a lot of insensible water loss that way as well. So looking at the trans-epidermal water loss, uh, there's a great deal of difference, uh, as you saw previously, in terms of weight with both um, the age and the size of the baby. So the, the, the smaller baby, the below 28 week, baby, week gestation baby, has a great deal of insensible water loss through the skin early on, and that decreases markedly over time uh, to about term levels by three weeks. Uh, and that's in large part due to skin maturation, where you just don't have the, uh, the epidermal maturity, the keratin level, at 26 weeks, 27 weeks gestation, or in our case, 26 weeks gestation that you do at term. But this, this matures relatively rapidly over a period of weeks, uh, and things will change in terms of epidermal, skin, uh, epidermal water loss, as well as temperature needs uh, as um, our baby progresses through time. Um, how do we assess uh, the baby's thermo uh, uh, status? This is more challenging than one might think. Uh, it's very important to get an accurate temperature, but where do you get it? So uh, getting a core temperature, so having a rectal temp, for instance, uh, is, it can be important. Uh, measuring the core in some places, some way can be important, particularly if you can be non-invasive about it. But a fall in core temperature can be a very light, late sign of hypothermia, as we discussed way in the beginning. So you, you don't want to be catching a baby when the core temperature is really down. You want to be catching them before they've kicked in all the, all the other mechanisms that we talked about. Uh, you don't want them wasting their energy and maintaining their temperature. And skin temperature is important to monitor, but it obviously can be a very poor surrogate for core temperature. And so we're sort of stuck. We often measure the core temperature, periodically measure the, uh, often measure the skin temperature, periodically measure the core temperature. Um, but none of these are a great mechanism to measure how the baby is doing. And, and, and sometimes it's just really physical exam and understanding that this is an important thing to be considering. Uh, uh, is the way is the best way to manage babies. There are some signs and symptoms of cold stress, so many of these signs obviously can be occur can occur from other things. But restlessness, abdominal distension or vomiting, shallow irregular breathing, grunting, uh, respiratory uh, 
um, symptoms as well as bradycardia all can be signs of cold stress and so we've certainly seen babies uh, with uh, preterm babies with these symptoms, hard to tell whether it's cold or, or, or stress or other things, but it's something that should be in the differential and often is not. So a baby that uh, has just been taken out for some reason, either bathed or weighed, uh, or even just changed in terms of their uh, environment for some reason, may exhibit some signs that are really quite dramatic based, to, based on cold stress. And you may not be detecting it by core temperature if you're measuring it, and certainly may not be de de detecting it by skin temperature. So these are important things to recognize. And I think points out that the challenge is we don't really know how often cold stress, or for that matter, heat stress, is an issue in preterm babies. We may be attributing lots of other things uh, to, this, uh, to these, these factors. Uh, cooling does have a dramatic impact on all sorts of things that occur in the baby. And some of these are uh, difficult to reverse. So whereas you saw some of the symptoms, there are effects of cooling in terms of vasoconstriction, uh, release of um, uh, hormones, uh, shunting, hypoxia, et cetera. And so you can certainly, in all we've all seen, very sick babies uh, do uh, particularly uh, preterm babies due to really just inadequate or ineffective uh, heating or cooling of the baby. Uh, this is particularly true in the delivery room and it's oftentimes that a baby uh, is, is cooler in the delivery room and just by warming them up a lot of their symptoms can go away. Signs of heat stress uh, also occur, uh, poor feeding, irritability, hypotonia or lethargy. They sometimes can flush and have a bright red skin color. They can certainly have change in vital signs and babies can actually look very sick uh, when they're too warm. Uh, all of us have seen babies um, have, um, have difficulties uh, due to you know, an incubator that's not working well, radiant warmer or some other things uh, that can go on to cause uh, a thermo irregularity. And we, you know, we just sort of write it off and say, let's, Let's fix that and it should get better. These, some of these things can take a while to, to improve. And, and certainly in the uh, animal world, when we do research, we see dramatic impacts of just small degrees of change of preterm, of, of, of in the preterm animals in, in terms of thermoregulation. So it's something to consider, probably underestimated in the, uh, in the nursery. Now we have two real ways of managing um, babies and now we have the hybrids of the two of them. But in the terms of preterm babies, there's incubators and warmers. And this, this is no news to many of you that the, uh, the challenges and the mechanisms uh, exist and we have to weigh the pros and cons of each before we use them. So one of the main reasons to use a warmer is it's improved access. That's why we have the hybrids so you can get in there right away. Um, the Heat source mechanism convection is in the incubator and radiant, warm, radiant warmth is in the, in the warmer. So the warmer, uh, will, you'll lose a lot of um, uh, heat by evaporation uh, and convection, whereas in the incubator, you'll lose a lot of heat through radiation. Uh, we've instituted the use of standard use really of double walled incubators uh, to prevent some radiation, but uh, you will uh, still lose some particularly noticeable between day and night cycles if a baby's near a window. Insensible water loss can be diminished in an incubator quite dramatically, especially if they're humidified. Uh, it's very difficult to prevent insensible water loss on a warmer bed, and if you have to, have to manage for some reason a very preterm baby like the one we have in the beginning, on a warmer, you're probably going to have to go up on the fluids quite dramatically and manage those electrolytes closely. Uh, and it's, it, it, it goes without saying that a baby in an incubator is not often as touched and it has much more minimum stimulation than a baby in a warmer who tends to be uh, touched not only because they're more available but because they're, they're often sicker. This should be a consideration uh, in the management of the babies. Uh, clearly, humidification, which we'll talk about for the next um, a few minutes, is important. Humidification during the first few weeks will add a great deal of stability uh, to the temperature of a baby if done correctly. So in this, in this study, um, uh, the core temperature is much more stable in humidified uh, incubator than in the non-humidified incubator. And that's, that's true that it, it will not only prevent insensible water loss, decrease your need for fluid management. 
uh, fl for, for amounts of fluids you need to manage the baby, but also uh, stabilize the um, ups and downs of the core temperature. So clinically rec clinical recommendation would be, since the baby is losing so much humidity, uh, so much fluid through the uh, skin, and the humidity will prevent that. And because the babies are so prone to instability that we would recommend uh, you considering humidity uh, for babies less than 30 weeks gestation and, and for the first week of life. And in fact, our protocol at Jefferson in intensive care nursery is for babies less than 30 weeks, we start at 70% humidity and we will wean that slowly over the first two weeks. But babies stay in humidity for two weeks if they're less than um, a kilogram or less than 30 weeks. So that's, that's a protocol that we came up with, uh, a guideline that we came up with and we've been using successfully for many years. Um, you, you can monitor and change the humidity depending on uh, certain factors. For instance, uh, the, the temperature of the baby becomes too high, you consider changing the humidity, although we rarely have to do that. Um, but it can be monitored as a real and, and altered as a thermoregulating device. Uh, the newer incubators have a, a really fine-tuned humidity system that, that, that reduces the risk markedly for uh, infection, and when done correctly by a skilled team, uh, it can really help the baby in terms of thermostability. Um, clearly, we can't forget, though, that babies um, need to be uh, nurtured, and so you know we've all gone through mechanisms of allowing babies to be thermo thermoregulated, thermoregulated in various environments. Kangaroo care should be encouraged and um, certainly helps in many different ways and, and the baby still can be managed effectively uh, in that environment. Uh, so back to our baby girl, Al. She was in humidity at, for, uh, in an incubator for 14 days. She actually went into the incubator very quickly after birth, uh, was in there within uh, the first six hours, stayed in the incubator uh, for the um, first few months, for, few months of her life until she got to be 1,808 grams and then we nicely out of that and uh, made it home. And here she is, a beautiful little girl today. Um, the challenges of incubator management and, uh, and thermoregulation uh, really, I think, are somewhat underestimated. And that's, that's depicted in this slide. We looked at, through uh, the permission of a Lear and their database of many babies, um, incubator weaning pro uh, um, processes throughout the country. And we looked at many babies and showed a great deal of variation in when babies come out of the incubator, depending somewhat on style. And so many nurseries have, have either ingrown, uh, homegrown program, uh, protocols or uh, just sort of um, words of wisdom and they change how they wean babies uh, from incubators. Some places we found uh, wean, wean babies from incub incubators when they get to a certain weight, so 1,800 grams or two kilos. Some go by physiologic parameters, et cetera. But there is a great deal of variation in when babies come out of incubators. And that can be problematic when you have this much of much variation in standard uh, treatment pro processes. Uh, you can show a great deal of outcome differences. And so this is something w we should look at more closely. Um, I think incubator management and thermoregulation has been put on the back burner, as I said. And it's something that really does seem to impact uh, on the outcomes of babies. And so in this, this study, uh, again from the Lear database, uh, we show that the later you come out of the incubator, so weight that you come out, come to an open crib on the bottom, changes outcomes in terms of uh, weight gain, uh, time to discharge, uh, length of stay, and even the ability to PO feed. Now, some of this may be due to you know, sicker babies being maintained in an incubator, but I think by and large, this study suggests, because the numbers are so large, that uh, our decision to keep to delay weaning from an incubator does impact on both length of stay and our interest in allowing the baby or encouraging the baby to nipple feed. And that may impact on weight gain. As you can see, the later they come out of the incubator, the, the slower the weight gain, which is sort of counterintuitive to some of the myths out there that, that incubators are keeping babies happy and therefore warmer uh, and, and therefore growing uh, better. It doesn't appear from the data that that's always the case. Now we do know that there's a small percentage, two, three percent of babies that uh, don't 
wean successfully out of incubators, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. And uh, our suggestion at, at, at Jefferson is uh, certainly by 1,800 grams, and literature suggests that by 1,800 grams, most babies should be uh, attempting to wean out of the incubator. Uh, there are you know, clearly differences that we talked about in the beginning, but this is something that should be looked at more carefully uh, and, um, and perhaps more protocolized in intensive care nurseries.